In this video, we're going to talk about a mass oscillating on a spring. We're going to figure out how can we come up with an equation that describes the motion of such a physical system. And in fact, we've actually done this example previously in my differential equations playlist. We just didn't have friction at that time. The real point of this video is to add in friction. So if you want to check out that video, check out the link down in the description. So what were we talking about? We had a mass here. It was on a spring. It could be extended from an equilibrium position. And if you let go, you can imagine that it would oscillate back and forth. And let's try to understand the forces that were involved. We had previously described how by Newton's law, there was a force's mass times acceleration or mass times x double prime. We talked about Hooke's law, which I will now call Fs for the spring force, since there'll be a couple different springs, which was negative kx, where x here was the displacement from the equilibrium. And now I'm going to add in a third thing, and that is the force of friction, or a damping force. So I'll call it FF, and this is going to be, well, it's proportional to the velocity. It's a negative C times X prime. Here's the idea. You know when you're driving really fast and you stick your hand out the window? You feel a lot of force. But if you're just walking, you don't feel as much force. Basically, the faster you go, the higher your velocity, the bigger your x prime, the more the friction forces are going to be affecting you. And indeed, it's also a negative value, if c is thought of as positive, because the force pushes against the direction in which you're traveling. If you're traveling this way, the force is an impediment to your motion. Either way, since Newton's law is the sum of the forces, I can combine all of these things and say that mx double prime plus cx prime plus kx is equal to zero. And now what I have is a differential equation. I can forget the context. This is just a second order constant coefficient differential equation. So let's try and solve it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is the same trick I always do. I'm gonna guess x is equal to e to the rt. I plug this in, I get a characteristic equation of mr squared plus cr plus k is equal to zero, as well as an e to the rt on every term, which I would cancel. And then if I want to solve for my r, well, it's just the quadratic formula here. Okay, so now there's a quadratic formula, but I've got these arbitrary constants, and so there's actually a bunch of different cases of what this quadratic formula could do. Case one could be that the thing under the square root is negative, it's, it's less than zero, in which case you'd have a complex pair of roots. The square root of a negative would be imaginary. The other case would be that the thing underneath the square root would be positive, in which case you'd have minus c over 2m plus something and minus something real, you'd get two real and distinct roots. And the third case would be that the thing under the square root was zero, in which case you'd get plus or minus zero, you'd just get the same root with multiplicity two. We call that a real repeated root. So we've seen these possibilities when we've studied constant coefficient equations before, but what I want to do is interpret each of these three things Physically, well, what does that mean physically in the context of a mass on a spring? So let's deal with the complex case first where c squared minus 4mk is negative. This is called the underdamped case. That is the damping which comes from the c value is smaller and this makes this thing negative. So what I actually really wanna do is take the roots r and break them up into the real and complex part. So I'm gonna separate it. I've got a minus c over 2m on the left, that's real and then plus or minus something imaginary. And I'm actually gonna relabel it, I'm just gonna call this i omega one here. So square root of c squared minus four mk all divided by two m, that whole thing is gonna be imaginary. It's an imaginary number times omega one, that's my definition. Now, in the previous video, when we talked about mechanical vibrations with no friction, we had something called omega naught. And omega naught was just square root of k over m. But if you went to this formula, you plugged in c equal to zero, the fours would cancel and you'd have a square root m on the top and an m on the bottom, that would become square root of k over m as well. So in the case where c equal to zero, omega one is just equal to omega naught. Okay, so that's fine. And now we can state what the solution is knowing how to solve constant coefficients. That is our general solution is, well, e to the real component times t. So e to the negative c over two m times t. And then the contribution of the imaginary parts is going to be a cosine term and a sine term. So a cos omega one times t and b sine omega one times t. It's just convenient to have these, these frequencies omega one in here. It's gonna make this just all a little bit shorter to write down. Now I can still do the same trick that we did in the previous video in the frictionless case. 
as in I have a cosine and a sine term and I can do this shift that makes it just become a single cosine term, C cosine of omega 1t minus gamma, that little offset. And we'll talk about exactly what that's gonna mean in a moment. Okay, so let's try to get a sense of what's going on here graphically. So now I've gone and graphed this. What I've inputted in is a constant times the negative exponential, I just call it e to the minus p, where p is some positive number, and then cosine of what we could call omega 1t and then minus the shift gamma or, or g using uh, Roman characters. So what's going on here? Well, the C, the G, and the W, we've played with them before. If you increase the C, you increase the amplitude. If you increase the G, you just shift everything left and right. And if you change the omega, you change the frequency. We've seen all of those before in the frictionless case. What's new here is the value of this P. And what you'll notice by this exponential growth is that as I increase it or decrease it, it changes the nature of what I'll call this envelope curve. Indeed, this top curve here, where I'm sort of tracing along with my mouse here, would just be the exponential without any trigonometric terms, without any oscillations. Likewise, this curve that sort of envelopes along the bottom would be the negative of that exponential without any sine or cos terms. So you can sort of imagine having this envelope here of the exponential and its negative, and then what happens is the curve oscillates back and forth in between that. And so as t goes to infinity, because it's a negative in the exponent of our exponential, it just drops it down to zero. And you can sort of see if I take the, the frequency slider and, and drag it all the way to the right, that envelope curve becomes just a little bit more transparent. You might choose to ignore what happens before t equal to zero if you plot this backward for negative t's, you can see that it's sort of blowing up, but maybe we'll imagine our, our only considering about the, the t greater than zero uh, scenario in our model. Okay, and then if I try to translate this graph into the physical situation of my block going back and forth, the idea is that it oscillates back and forth, but because of the friction, the amplitude starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it just settles at the equilibrium point. That's what this is showing. It's saying we still have the oscillations, but that the amplitude is being diminished by the e to the negative pt. So it goes and has your oscillation back and forth, but it lowers its amplitude, and finally, as t goes to infinity, it's gonna settle right down at that equilibrium point. The second case we're gonna consider is what I call the overdamped case. So this is when c squared minus 4mk is greater than zero, when you have a lot of friction, so the c is a big number. Well, in that case, we get these two different real roots. And so what you're gonna get is something to the form a times e to the r1t plus b times e to the r2t, where r1 and r2, those are both going to be negative values your m, c, and k here are all positive. So, so this is gonna be a net negative. So basically as time goes on, x is gonna to go to zero, there's gonna be an exponential decay. So what does this look like? Well, I don't even need to graph it to understand it because they're both negative exponentials. As time goes on, it's just gonna be exponential decay down to the value of x equal to zero. It's just gonna be like a block that does this and settles on the equilibrium. So there's no oscillation here, right? There's no sine or cosine term. It's just this exponential decay back down to the equilibrium spot. So the way I imagine this is like, imagine your spring is in molasses or something with this enormous amount of friction. It's so much friction that there actually isn't an allowed oscillation. It just starts off set from the equilibrium points and it decays down to the equilibrium point. The Third and final possibility is what is called critically damped. This is of course very rare, it's hard to have things being equal to zero exactly, but this is when the c squared minus 4mk is precisely equal to zero. Now, what would happen in this scenario? Well, if you tried to solve it, we would say you've got repeated roots, and we knew that the method for repeated roots is you take the one root, e to the rt, but then for the second, you can't just repeat it because it would be e to the rt again, you do t e to the rt. That's why it's b times t times e to the rt. The r is still negative, which makes it seem like it would just go right down with exponential decay back to the equilibrium point, kind of like in the overdamp case. But the t here, it means that it increases. So you have a sort of a competition of the effect. The exponential terms are dragging it down to zero, the t is making it larger. So let's just turn to the software to get a really good visual picture of what this one looks like. Graphing our critically damp case, I put in an e to the rt plus t e to the rt. I just made my two coefficients both one, just to illustrate the point. And what you see is that for this particular value of r, r does need to be negative. But what happens is when you start at t equal to zero, 
it increases for a little while, and that's because of that T term dominating, that the T is, is causing this increase in the value. But then as time goes on, it decays and decays and decays back down to the equilibrium position, where well, in this case, what we're calling Y is equal to zero. And indeed, exactly the behavior you're gonna get is gonna depend on the initial conditions. I mean, I had sort of chosen initial conditions such that I would get one and one. You can imagine one of those initial conditions could be about telling your initial position, your initial velocity, so in this case, with this value of coefficient from these initial conditions, what happens is that the displacement starts, if it's being offset a little bit, it goes further away, so perhaps that meant it had an initial velocity sending it to get larger, and it goes away for a while, and then it comes back, and then eventually just comes in and settles right down at the origin. All right, so in the end, the mechanical vibrations with friction can have these three different cases. The underdamp case, where you do have these sort of nice oscillations, Overdamp case where it's just this exponential decay back to the equilibrium point and this kind of funky critically damp case. So if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any thoughts or questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.